grateful to um, have been with you all today and be up here in Gardnerville. And some people asked us during the breaks, um, well, how did you all get connected? And so that's um, thus our title, Braided. So we'll tell you just a little bit about that since we don't have a lot of time. And then we're going to go into a Q&A time. And, or you can comment and share um, some of, if God revealed anything to you today and if there's anything you want to share, we can do that. But we, um, so after my husband passed away, I had a mutual fr uh, friend come to me. And she said, I have a friend. Frank had been gone about three or four months. And she said, I have a, a, a friend that lost her husband and her son during a, um, in a plane crash, and would you like to meet her? And I'm like, well, yes, absolutely. Because I was 51 when Frank passed away. I literally turned 51 while he was in the coma. And there's not a whole lot of younger widows around. At least there wasn't at that time. So... Um, my friend set up a lunch, and I met Debbie. Her name was Debbie Rooney at the time. It's now Debbie Rooney Jaso. And we got together and just hit it off. And she was a believer. I was a believer. And it was just so wonderful for me to have her in my life and all that. And then, I think it was about eight months later, I hear a friend of mine, excuse me, a friend of mine tells me that there's a gal who lost her husband and son in a car accident, and her daughter taught at the school where the young man went, and her name was Debbie Siciliani. Well, I'm Italian, so I'm like, oh. And then my first thought was, oh my gosh, she has got to meet my friend Debbie, because they have so much in common. And so I knew that I wanted to somehow work it out so that we could get them together. So I told my friend, can you please tell your daughter to you know, help me with this? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it never happened. And one day I even went down to the school, and I saw Debbie standing like right where those, those gifts are. And I froze. And my friend is elbowing me like, that's her, that's Debbie Siciliani. And I, I just couldn't bring myself to go up to her and say, excuse me, I know, know who you are. And, you know, so I just froze. And then I talked to my friend and I looked up and she was gone. And so the interesting thing, though, is that these two met, and we're not going to give it away, they met outside of the country. And it, it was a big lesson for me. When God wants something to happen, he's going to make it happen. And he did. Um, do you have anything you wanted to share? Oh, I have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so five days after my tragedy, my girlfriends were sitting on the couch with me. And I said, I need to find somebody. I need to find somebody who not only lost their spouse, but a child at the same time. And I know God's going to bring me that person. I don't know when, but I know he will. You see, when my mom died, I was six years old. And I didn't grieve my mom. Okay, I didn't know how to grieve her. So when I was 40 years old, it was time. It was time to grieve her. And I found a support group called Motherless Daughters of Orange County. And there were all these mom, mom, women like me who lost their moms when they were this high like me. And when I went there, oh my gosh, it was like, you get my pain. And I, and I started to finally grieve my mom. And I did the hard work of grief, and it was so hard to do. I finally healed from my mom's death six months before the tragedy. <sighs> so that's why I was like, huh, I know what to do. And I know God's going to bring me that person. And he did. He did. 
Okay, and I'm not going to give it away. But what I'm going to tell you, it's incredible. It's only God. And I only, it was because I was obedient to God. I listened to God. I did not want to go out of the country by myself. Okay? But no, he kept, I kept hearing that little whisper in my ear, you need to go. I'm like, no, you need to go. And I finally said, okay, I'll go. We wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be up on the stage because if I didn't go, I wouldn't have met Debbie. I wouldn't have met Gina. And we three here wouldn't have written the book Braided. It's all, right? It's all. Our story is his story. It's his story. And we, our three of us, are allowing to use our pain for his glory. So one other little interesting tidbit is, so we all meet, and um, again, no co- I don't, we don't believe it was a coincidence one bit. We believe God was totally in it, and it was, as she said, just taking these little steps out of your comfort zone. But, so after we meet, and we all you know, become friends, my <clears throat> son-in-law's mother got cancer. Uh, So this was a couple years after Frank died. And after about a year, you know, he was really grieving and missing his wife. And he had told the kids that he wanted to really meet somebody else and get remarried. And so my daughter asked me, you know, called me and said, do you think that Debbie Siciliani would be interested in meeting Ron? And I was like, oh, I didn't think of that. Well, I think so. She's ready to start dating. So Christina asked for a picture of Debbie, and Christina showed her father-in-law, and he said, well, yes, I'd like to meet her. And Christina told him her story to make sure he was okay, because it's a pretty heavy situation. And to make a long story short, they met for a lunch, which turned into a dinner, and they've been together ever since. So now she is my (laughs) in-law. Like she, like we're family now. (laughs) Yes, we share grandchildren and all of that. So, kind of, kind of crazy, huh? Anyways, um. Is Christina here somewhere? Do, 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 do. There she is. We're gonna, um, we'll open it up now to comments or questions or just you want to praise the Lord for something, whatever. And we'll end at three. What time is it? We have 25 minutes. And um, oh, you've got a microphone. Okay. And just try to keep your comments short so we can get, if there's a lot of people that want to make a comment. Hello. Put Hello. your hand up. Oh, you did? I thought you raised well, I did. I wanted to ask the name of the book. Um, the name of the book? Debbie. If you want in the middle. Uh-huh. Told us 1,000. <laughs> oh. Anne Voskamp. Yes. 1,000 gifts. 1,000 gifts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> V-O-S-K-A-M-P. <laughs> there was another book that you talked about that had joy in the title. Oh, that was the Kay Warren. Oh, yeah. oh Kay. Choose, choose Joy by Thank Kay Warren. Debbie in the middle. You're, you said a scripture at the very end about the last word was joy. <laughs> like, in, yeah. God will light your path and then it will be turn into joy. But you didn't reference it and I can't. Wait, 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 wait. In your, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I just know that that's scripture, scripture, but I don't know which one it is. Fullness of joy. We can find it. Okay, I'll find it. Yeah. We can find it. Somebody, somebody knows it? Psalm 16, 11. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Psalm 16. Yep. <laughs> 
Her husband Jay would have known. <laughs> That was a teaser. Yeah. Right here. Another sentence that didn't get finished in, in my book. We didn't choose what happened to us, but choose to. Is it as simple as just find joy? Was that the end of that sentence? Is that for me? <laughs> the last one. Oh, that yeah. one's you, Debbie. The, the, the one that says in, in your presence is fullness of joy? Yes. No. She, was that the one? <laughs> yeah, I think she was. I think I might have written it down too. <laughs> Afterwards, she'll yeah. have her paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I have too many notes to say. It's really been neat, by the way. You guys are so schooled in your scripture and we just love that that hasn't been an experience we've had a lot of so we appreciate that that speaks to the pastor at this church Aww. right <laughs> yeah yep. yes is it working yeah you can hold it low it's good so a little bit of a personal, well, no very personal question. For the two of you who lost a spouse and a child at the same time, I can imagine it was very hard to grieve your loss for two different reasons, but then you still had children that you had to teach them how to grieve as well. How did you negotiate that? That's a great question. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, my kids were older, the, my two other boys were older, so I don't, you know, they, they knew themselves that they needed to, you know, do their own grieving. Um, I mean, it definitely is complicated because not only am I, I mean, they're doing the same thing. They're grieving their father and their brother. So it's two, it's like two people. It's very complicated and, and it, I think for some people, it's like you, you do them separately. And so you, you have moments of you know, overwhelming grief for one versus the other. Um, for myself, um, grieving a husband was different than grieving my child. That was really, really difficult. You know, my husband was you know, he had lived a really good life. And, um, but my son was expecting their second child. And so my daughter-in-law gave birth, you know, without um, her husband there. And, and Reese, to, you know, never got to meet her father. So, yeah, I think, I think you, you do them separately. And it's complicated and it's hard. She's talking about the kids, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 The kids. So, kids. <clears throat> yeah, so for me, oh, so because I lost my mom when I was so, so young and what I experienced with my dad in grief, he literally, my mom was dead and he shut that door, locked it, and we didn't talk about her ever again, pretty much. So that's why it was just like in my siblings and I, every time we bring up my mom, it was like, okay, enough, we can't handle it, you know? So I decided, and I even yelled at my dad the night that my husband and son died. I said, I'm not going to do what you did to me. I'm going to celebrate them. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Well, I did all that. And I had the pictures of them everywhere in my house, and we would, I would talk about them all the time, and I would, we'd celebrate their birthdays and this and that. And oh, my son, my 13-year-old son, who was in the car accident, okay? He survived, praise God, but he had survivor's guilt. And it was too much for him. And he, I, I mean... And so I was like, oh my gosh, okay. So we all grieve differently. And we just, I just had to learn, 
Okay, so I had to take down all the pictures, and I talked to, I got him a therapist right away. All my kids had therapy, therapist. And I talked to the therapist, and he said, kids grieve at different stages. There might not be grieving now with you. Okay, you don't see him crying now, but they will grieve, and they grieve like when my daughter graduated from high school. Oh. She just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. So it's going to be a long journey because, you know, I still have a 16-year-old, you know, in the house. My daughter's going to be 22. My other son is, you know, 25. And we still have a long, long road ahead. But God is with us. We see that hand. I'm like really loud okay. <laughs> okay. Um, as far as like you guys talked a little bit about therapy, um, and I know that can be kind of a taboo subject when it comes to the Christian faith, etc. How do you fit that into your life and your trauma specifically? And how? What does that look for each? Like, what does that look like for each of you? Because that's something that I struggle with personally. When you say you struggle, you mean what do you mean by that? Um, Going? For going. Oh. You know, a lot of people will say, Don't feel guilty. Then, yeah. then there's the attitude of like, oh, you're just not praying enough, or you're not doing enough, or you're not serving enough. You know, no. there's a lot of that attitude. No. Mm-hmm. no, that is not right. Um, well, I'll pass the mic, but right off the bat. So psychology means study of the soul. Who should, who should study the soul? We should. And there was a time when pastors were trained, this was going back a few centuries ago, pastors were trained in counseling. Well, now there's so much going on, pastors can't handle it all. So there are people who are gifted that go to school and get trained, and they don't buy into everything they're learning from Darwin and, you know, um, who's the father of psychology? Freud, I had a blank. So they don't buy into it. So there's Christian universities who have wonderful program, PhD programs and master's degrees. So you just seek out a godly therapist and don't feel one bit guilty about it. Um, You know, there's verses like there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. So we're made to be in community and deal with things. So when I hear stories about people being told, just go read your Bible and pray about it. Well, that's part of dealing with our soul and dealing with stuff. That's only part of it. So don't feel guilty. Okay. Do you have anything you want to say? Um, Yeah, yeah, I, I would say don't feel guilty also because I mean, I, I needed, I, I mean, it was complicated grief and I went to my pastor and but I needed something more and more often and um, one of my sons also went to therapy and one decided he didn't he didn't want to go to therapy Um, so yeah I think it's very individual but I I I would highly recommend it (laughs) do you want to say anything? Mm -hmm. I can tell you, honestly, before the tragedy, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't like therapy. I did go once with my husband. I'm like, "Mm." that night, that night when I heard, found out my husband and son died, I'm like, somebody better find me a therapist. I need help. A Christian one, though. I needed a Christian therapist. And I said, I need one for my son, too, and my daughter. My little one was a little too young. He was six. And they did. They, and then the minute my, we came home from Vegas, we had it all lined up, and my son refused to go. But my late husband's brother was amazing. And he said, Greg, you're going, and I will take you. 
And he took him once a week for a year. And he took him then out to dinner. I love my late husband's family. They were so, I still love them. I'm still so close to them. And then to this day, my 13-year-old son, now 25, is still seeing him. And I said, I will pay for him the rest of your life because I know it's so good. And so I see it come. I don't know when he sees him, but oop, there it is. He saw him again. He saw him again, and I love it. And now my, um, my 16-year-old now is seeing him. So I believe in it. <laughs> and don't feel guilty. Okay, I wanted to say something about your 16-year-old. I think it's so wild that you lost your mom at six, and your 16-year-old lost his parent at six. So what a big help. Talk about your our joy going before other people, right? Yeah. You must have been the parent to him that you didn't have. Yeah. When, I, yeah. I remember that night, and I just looked at him. Because I never wanted my kids to go through what I went through, losing a parent. And now here we are. And I'm looking at him, and I'm like, no, God, no. But that's when, and then my, and I didn't tell you guys this, but when my daughter, she was 11, and then when she said, Mom, who's going to walk me down the aisle? Oh, my God. So I grabbed her, and I grabbed my little six-year-old, and I'm like, and that's when I did, you know, no, God is with us, and he's going to take care of us. And it's been a journey. It's been really hard, especially for my 16-year-old right now, you guys. He needs lots of prayer. We're going through a lot with him right now. So Samuel James Siciliani. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I have not lost multiple loved ones at once, but my daughter, when she was 21, was murdered in South Lake Tahoe, shot to death. And that was really hard for me. I cried myself to sleep for nine months straight. And after that time, I realized that's how long I had her in the womb. It was just something that struck me. But what I want to say in terms of encouragement for everyone is that we do not want to waste our suffering, OK? God is the God of all comfort, and he calls us to take our things that we've been through to comfort others, and I think one or more of you ladies mentioned that in your speaking. It is so important that we do that. Don't waste the suffering. Let God work all things together for good to them that love the Lord and are called for his purpose, okay? So we want to allow him to work in and through us, and he will give us total victory if we really submit ourselves to him and ask him to deliver us from anger, resentment, betra betrayal, bitterness, whatever it is we're struggling with, he is faithful. So I just encourage you to give it to God and don't waste that suffering. Pass it on to help others. Amen. I don't need this either, but um, <laughs> um, so on the previous comments, when you do share your suffering, are you getting good feedback from non-believers? Are you getting, I mean, what are you getting out of sharing your soul with people? You want to do it? You <laughs> Well, to be honest, <clears throat> most people really appreciate when we share. They really do, and they get it. 
but occasionally we've come across some groups that um, maybe in a more secular environment, they're really angry at God. And they kind of don't jive with us because we're not. That doesn't mean that we were, when it happened, we were like, oh, thank you, Lord, you know. No. We were crying and saying why and all that. But um, I think some non-believers have a very hard time. And then another comment we've had is, this is too sad. This is just too sad. They, I think a lot of people just don't want to hear these stories and don't want to think about this, you know. And that's understandable to some degree, of course. It's not a fun, happy topic, you know. But that hasn't stopped us, and it won't stop us. And quite frankly, there's even, um, now I'm getting on my bandwagon, but churches, think about it, and I don't know about up here in Gardnerville, but back at, in Southern California, there have not been a lot of ministry to widows and people going through grief. We all have heard of grief share. That's great. But a lot of churches don't even have a grief ministry. So that's been kind of a mission of ours, too. And now there's kind of this little neat thing happening in Southern California. There's um, some big churches where widows' ministries and grief ministries are popping up. So it's been really neat, and we're speaking at them and sharing our story. And yeah. Just last week, last Saturday, um, a 13-year-old girl who many of us knew, we know her, the mother and the grandmother, um, she died as a result of uh, appendicitis that burst. And so from, so for many of us, who haven't gone through the same experiences that you have, how do we minister? How do we comfort? What, do we, what helped you from other people when you were in the first mm -hmm. beginnings of the loss? That's a really good question. And one of the things that I would most recommend is to get whoever it is in connected with somebody else that perhaps has gone through something similar. There is such power in connection um, and yeah. <laughs> um, but that, if I could say one thing that helped me the most, it's being con connected with somebody who has experienced something similar. You speak the same language. You understand each other. Like it, and for you, like you're saying, you're, it's, you have this feeling of helplessness. Like, what do I do? I don't understand. I don't. I'm. I'm not sure. Um, so that that's that's my my number one recommendation. Everyone grieves differently. Um, for me, is just showing up. So I loved when they just showed up and they didn't say, "Oh, just call me." You know, I'm not going to call you. They're not going to call you. Just show up. Show up with food. Get a food train going. Um, I highly encourage you not to say, how are you doing? Because her life sucks right now, okay? So when people would ask, how are you doing? I'm like, and so what I told them to say on, this, on a scale of one to 10, where are you today? And I would say nine. And they would just hug me and pray over me. And the other thing is I'll just let them talk about their daughter, her daughter. All I wanted to do was talk about Jim and Nick, Jimbo and Nick, Jimbo and Nick. I didn't, because the fear of they're gone, but they're in heaven, they're in heaven, but they're not with us. 
and your the biggest fear is everyone's going to forget about him. So, so talk about memories of if you know her, share memories. For me, it comforted me. I'm like, I, I mean, that was the biggest thing for me. And as time goes by, you know, some we often think, oh, six months has passed. They're okay now. They're not okay. So not everyone is going to be called to be there in the long haul, but it's important to, to stay, you know, stay in it so that, that in a year, as a year goes by, they don't feel like, well, where did everybody go? So that's really key. I, I t counsel a lot of widows, and they feel like after a year, everybody disappears. Friends sometimes don't know how to relate to you anymore. You're not a couple. And so their life goes on, and they forget about you. Thankfully, that hasn't happened with my friend Cindy, who's here. <laughs> she still loves me. Does that help? I just wanted to say that when it comes to grief and loss and trying to be there for someone else, listen to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you to speak or not to speak. If it's God's divine will for you to connect with that person, maybe today isn't the day for me to do that. Trust God, let him know, I really want to reach this person, and trust me, he'll make a way, just like he did with you all. Yes, yes. amen. Thank you. That's so good. Oh, over there. Hold on one second. Did you, did you want to say something again? Did you have your hand oh, up earlier? No. no? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> did you? No? Okay. We're, uh, by the way, we're going to be back at the table if anybody would like us to sign their book or talk to us. We'll be back there. Oh, one, we have time for one more. Good afternoon. I've really enjoyed this. And um, I would like to give a little bit of story about my life, but wonder if it happened in any of your lives. Um, before my husband was diagnosed with brain cancer, it was about a year before it, <clears throat> I enjoyed doing studies on my own. And the Lord said, okay, I want you to study battle. And I thought, what are you talking about, God? I'm a woman. What do I want to study about battle? So my husband was like, oh, how cool. Well, you need to watch this movie and this movie and this movie and like the 300, you know, where, you know, there was battle. And what the Lord has shown me um, since my husband had brain cancer. And within five years, I lost him and my daughter-in-law and my oldest son. And I realized <laughs> this is why God has us in his word, to study his word. And I just wondered, did any of you hear from the Lord before your, your mates or your children died? Oh, okay. Just real quick, I, in Braided, um, there's a story where when I was 13, I had this mad crush on Frank, and I, um, I was a little Catholic schoolgirl, so I went uh, to class one day, and we had a visiting nun, and she talked about prayer, and she said prayer was just as much listening to God as it was, you know, going to God and talking to God. And so she, she taught us kind of, she, she was a believer, this nun, not, I hate to say that, but she was. Um, so as a 13-year-old girl, I went in my backyard, laid on a beach towel and was praying to God. And I got a, uh, I heard from the Lord, not audibly, but I heard Frank is going to die young. And I, I it's all in the book, but um, in both books that I wrote. Um, so yes. I believe that God does prepare us. And so at 13, and God asked me, do you still want to marry him? Because I was asking the Lord, I love him. Can he love me back? And can we get married? And so God told me that. 
And I thought, oh, I'm not supposed to hear that. So I laid down and did the whole prayer again. And God said it again. And, and I've never had an experience like that this since, but um, like that since. But um, I said, yes, I want to marry him. So I do believe that God does prepare us sometimes. I don't have a question, but I just want to say what a privilege to sit in the room with three women who faced some of the, the toughest, I'm sure, the toughest things you're going to face in life, and you overcame it by the blood of the Lamb. Your faith in Christ Thank you. stayed strong, and that stands out thank because you. he is our rock. And I just want to say thank you for coming and sharing your, your stories. Thank you. Okay, really quick before we end. Oh, someone else. Shameless plug or not. We do have a grief share. I think they're in week four out of like a week 10 or so. But we do. They do it about twice a year. And, um, oh, and there's um, proof and support on Thursday. Okay. So Mondays from 10 to noon here, um, call the church if you have any questions, if you'd like to come. Also, we have a um, women's support, growth and support group on Thursdays at 6.30, I think it is. Or 6 or 6.30. 6 or 6.30. Call me. Call the church. We'll get you hooked up. Okay. I guess it's meant to be. Okay, I'm going to make it as short as possible. So you know how I was telling you I get these amazing kisses from heaven, these God moments, and I wrote a book about all these special little moments that I had at the beach house. So in the chapter that says, I think it's chapter, I don't remember what chapter it is, but it's a chapter about a, a woman named Michelle, which was my, not a woman, she was a girl, she was my son's little sweetheart. And that chapter is one of my favorite favorite chapters and we we went to a restaurant called South of Nix in San Clemente and we I got to meet her got to sit with her we had an amazing time and let me tell you God met us at this restaurant called South of Nix and we had the most amazing God moments there. And my, one of my friends works with the owner, and his, his name is Nick. And she told me, the mother of the owner, Nick, attends this church. And she's here. Is she here? I want to meet you. And I'm going to give you a book because it's in my book, South of Nick's. Yes. Yes! Ah! So, there we go. Ah. Yeah. And my friend who works, her name is Celeste, and she is buying Nick my book. <laughs> Amazing. And Celeste told me to share this. And I was going to share it when I got up here and talked but it wasn't meant to be, and I told him it wasn't meant to be. And then right now, I said I was going to share it, and then she said, don't go long, Debbie. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to go long. And then you said, share it? That is God, right there. Amen. Ah! God is so real. Heaven is so real. Awesome. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes. I bet you can't figure out who these three presents are for a kid, can you? <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yay! Thank you. That was just amazing, and I love how God works and does all those God moments. 
we truly rely on the Holy Spirit for all the events we do and conferences and retreats. So it's just amazing because I'm always like, wow. <laughs> it's amazing how he's always in the details. I love it. Um, thank you for coming. I hope you all were blessed. And we'll go ahead and close out in prayer. If I can breathe, I'm still in awe. Heavenly Father, we just stand here in awe of you. <laughs> That's all I can say. I'm just amazed at your works. I'm amazed at how you work through people. I'm amazed at all the little details that you just put together. And even the South and Nick, that's just amazing. <laughs> Chances of that happening when there's 50 states. Um, and our little church in Gardnerville. Uh, I just ask that you would bless each lady that came. I ask that you put a shield of protection around them, that no fiery darts come at them when they walk out this building. And keep them safe and let them go home and take in what they learned and help us to all be able to find joy, even in all the things, good or bad. And also for the whiteboard over there, Lord, the ladies that wrote on it, I just ask that they leave it behind. It's on that board. That board's going to get erased, and I just pray that you would erase those there, step in and show those women who you are and help them to take control of it. And we just ask for a good rest of our day and get our speakers safely home. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.